Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming. Welcome to our 16th webinar. My name is Tamara, uh, and uh, I welcome you on behalf of InterVenture. We are a Swiss company that builds tailor-made A-star A distributed teams in Belgrade for our partners. Uh, at the moment, we have more than 40 open positions either in Belgrade or remote. So uh, take a look at our career page on our website if you're looking for a change. I will post the link in the chat box. I'm very proud and very glad that our guest tonight today is um, Jovan Vidic, who is an IT professional with more than 15 years of experience in technology. Over the time, Jovan switched between management and individual comp contributors' roles several times. He has worked for some of the biggest tech companies in Europe, including Zalando and uh, Amazon Web Services. And currently, he is senior solution architect at uh, AWS, working with enterprise customers in Germany. Jovan will answer your questions, and you can use both uh, chat box and Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel, channel tomorrow, so you can rewatch it if you like. Jovan, welcome again. Uh, thank you for accepting you. our call. We are very, very, very glad that you uh, that you are here today. Thank you very much. So let me just share my screen and we can start. Okay. Everything good? Yes. Okay, so hello again from my side. Uh, Tamara, thank you very much for inviting me and for, for this introduction. Uh, since Tamara said the most, I won't spend much time introducing myself. I will basically just start with the story. Why, why do I speak here and then how is everything? Uh, came as, as this presentation. So I think it was a few months ago when Tamara invited me to speak at their webinar and then we had a discussion, what can I talk about? And then I shared the idea because in the last couple of years, many friends and many former colleagues are approaching me and asking questions about, okay, how would you deal with this situation? How does it look like? What did you experience? And then basically I decided to create one talk where I, I will just share my experiences. What did I learn? What, which beliefs changed that I had before? before moving to Berlin. So this talk is going to be a lot about uh, my career, my views, they don't represent views of any company that I worked for. So it's only my idea and my experiences shared here. And I just want to share the story, like why did I end up in Berlin? So it's almost five years ago that I was here as a tourist and I love the city. Like this is the first city in Europe where I came and said, okay, this is maybe the place where I could live. And at the same time, I was thinking, okay, you know, after a lot of years in Serbia, delivering software, working on some complex distributed systems that had the continuous delivery pipeline, a lot of uh, good practices, I thought, you know, I'm ready to experience to work on the market and to go and to share my experience. And actually, while, while doing this and deciding to, to, to move Berlin, the last thing that I thought that I will need to challenge a lot of my beliefs, that I will need to change myself in order to grow. And I will give you a few examples where I needed to rethink my ways of working. Many people from Serbian community know me as founder of Agile Coaching Serbia and somebody who was a very, very big advocate of Agile software development and Agile software practices. And I think I still am. But I think that now my thinking about how you reach agility and what is agility changed a lot in the last couple of years. So I will reflect on this. So how I structured this is I'm going to talk about my experience as engineering manager. This mostly reflects uh, my time in Zalando. And um, I will focus there on key four key components, at least components that I consider to be key. And then um, you will also see what is my experience then with Amazon Web Services and this famous Amazon culture of innovation? And especially two things that I was impressed about, and this is writing and, and why writing is important and mechanisms. And if you are looking uh, from perspective of what are you going to get from this talk, I saw many of you joining as delivery managers and scrum masters, uh, then of course, uh, engineers, engineering managers, but I also saw some, some people who are C-level executives. So I, I will share things that are purely tactical that you can implement on a team, a team level, but also things that are more strategic and things that you can do if you want to design adaptive and agile organizations. So I will try to ensure that uh, there is something for everybody here. Now, I want to start uh, talking about engineering management just by sharing my thoughts there. I was 
before thinking a lot about self-organizing teams, even self-managing organizations. And I was thinking, okay, do we really need managers? What's the value of managers? And then experiencing this at a very large scale and with, with a lot of customers. And just to give you an example, Zalando has at the moment, I think 40 million customers and I think revenue over 8 billion euros. So if I'm not wrong, more than 14,000 employees. So like big organization, a lot of markets, a lot of things to do. Engineering organization was somewhere more than about 2000 engineers, something like this. So when you're part of such a system, then you start seeing things from a bit different perspective. And um, engineering management is actually a very important role. Uh, engineering manager do, does, do need to have a lot of skills that one agile coach would have. You need to understand process part. You need to understand how to work uh, with people, but there is much more. Now, if you are new to engineering management or if you are just becoming one, uh, I think the most important thing is uh, people leadership and how are you going to lead people. Uh, this is usually actually the last responsibility that you are going to get if you are starting as engineering manager. You will easily get responsibility for delivery. You will easily get responsibility for software architecture. But when it comes to coaching, developing people, guiding them to their career, this is very sensitive. And when you are really ready, and when you're starting as a manager, you get this. And uh, why is that? And why engineering manager, in my opinion, is a bit... Uh, more important role than just being like Scrum Master or Agile Coach. It's because uh, people who created Agile Manifesto, they did say, okay, people over processing tools, but most of them were actually technical people. Most of them were having engineering background or some kind of process background. Uh, but um, what when you are dealing with people is, is mostly about psychology and mostly about emotional reactions, people's beliefs, the way how they see the world and this is far more complex than just creating one manifesto, one process. And I invested a lot of my time into understanding human psychology and especially understanding myself and my own beliefs and seeing where they work, where they, where they don't work. And being engineering manager, I think, the, or manager at all, doesn't, doesn't matter actually you are leading people, is about self-awareness first. And, and why is that? Because you need to understand your own emotional reactions. This means that, uh, for example, I, I will tell you my personal story. Uh, if we would need to deliver software that is not according to my standards in terms of how we write tests, how many tests we have, what is the level of quality, is code nicely decoupled, did we follow clean code or some other practices, then I, I would get really upset, feel unhappy, come home unhappy because, you know, I'm not able to make influence that I want. But investigating this a bit deeper actually behind all that was my, my belief and my belief was that delivering software the best way to deliver software was to deliver it with high quality now um, there is nothing essentially wrong with this higher quality usually leads to better speed but the thing is that you are usually not shipping software you're shipping products and you are solving customer problems and then if you, if you reframe your belief or you reframe your view on the world, then you can have multiple options and you can feel in peace with decisions that you need to make. You can still have your North Star, you can still have your idea, but then suddenly instead of like advocating only this approach or only one way to do things, you can give yourself options. And why is that important for, for engineering manager? Because at the moment when you know to lead yourself, when you know, understand your emotional triggers, your belief system, how to change that, you need to help others to do the same. And another interesting example is I had a direct who approached me at the point of time when I was asking people in my team to uh, write when they require time to do technical improvements. So not just to discuss, but to write, to explain. And uh, he approached me and told me, okay, you are creating this highly bureaucratic process. Uh, I need to spend too much time to do a lot of work. And he was like visibly upset with the way how, how I approached this, this particular situation. Now, what I could do in this situation is also trying then to convince him and saying, no, I'm not creating bureaucratic process. I, I do know what is Agile software delivery, but this would not help. Instead of that, what you can try to do is actually try to understand, to listen and to, to understand his perspective. So asking more questions, okay, 
what does bureaucratic process mean for you? What did you experience in past? How, how would you see this unfolding? Uh, then also helping him to think about situations like where this could be beneficial, where this couldn't. Basically, with asking all these questions, you are asking, you are asking people to think critically about their beliefs and their values and, and the way how they see the world. And then it's actually not important, will the outcome be your way of working in the, or their way of working if you all both agree on the value that you want to deliver. And if you both have approach where you have discussion around arguments, not about opinions, beliefs, and feelings. And um, then I started the, going a bit deeper, learning more about debating skills, learning about how to go deeper, understand people. And basically what I like a lot is to, you know, ask questions from maybe a different perspective than people usually think. And recently in, in AWS, we have a process uh, which is used for onboarding engineers. And the process is basically that you need to go through some kind of mock exams where you, um, um, as, as a person who is just joining the company goes to several scenarios where we are mocking customer meetings. We want to enable people to be ready when they, when they actually face a real world scenario. And in one of these meetings where a colleague was presenting architectural solution for a business problem, everything well, went well. Um, at the end of the meeting, I asked him a question. Okay, in, in, in you propose this architecture, you, you see everything, but uh, why would you say that we should not use the solution that you proposed? And at that point of time, he stopped a bit and he was not sure why I'm asking this. So he managed to find an answer. But then later, what I told him is that I used this opportunity to teach him and to teach him to basically look at the risks and think critically about um, his approach and his way of working. And for me, that was the most important thing. So always look at things from different perspectives, always try to collect data because everything is contextual. Sometimes what you are recommending can work perfectly, sometimes it doesn't work at all. And you need to be able when working with people to show them that you, know, you are not just selling them solution, you really care about problem that they are trying to solve. So this is that part of, of um, leading people. Now, um, the thing that you get first when you are engineering manager is accountability for delivery of your team. So that, this doesn't mean that you are going to write code or that you are going to deliver every single feature, but at the end, you are the person who is uh, going to answer questions if they come to your team of why things are late or how things are progressing or all these things. And this is something that you don't delegate accountability. You do delegate the work, but accountability is always yours. And of course, setting up like process, I saw that so many times, is some kind of typical agile process. So it's uh, people have, uh, is it Scrum, Kanban, XP, whatever. You need to do some kind of planning. Is it more often, less often, depends on your context. You do some kind of review, you do some kind of retrospective, you have the team who is doing the work. So even though this looks like Scrum, my intention is not to present Scrum. It's like typical agile process where we have team, Team is self-organized, picking up the task, working on tasks. Now, reality looks a bit different because, you know, <laughs> what happens is, okay, in the middle of your iteration, one person gets sick and usually the person who is working on something that is critical. So somebody needs to jump in. Another person just comes from vacation and he needs to actually understand what was happening in the last couple of weeks. What did he miss? What does he need to do? And then suddenly incident happens and then the person from the team needs to drop everything and to investigate what is happening, to try to solve this, to write post-mortem. And of course, he needs to ask for help from another engineer. So he's also dropping from work. Then you actually have a couple of engineers working on one feature and maybe one engineer helping product managers to, to do the work. Now, I would say this is more close to reality of how, how, how things happen during the, the iteration. And then... You know, when this happens, you bring this group of people, you bring them to the retrospective and you tell them, okay, now let's try to facilitate conversation around what do you want to improve in the team? I mean, everybody is coming with their own view of the world. So you, you cannot just easily put people one hour into the meeting and expect miracles. And um, let's start with, with meeting that I see that is bringing a lot of problems and this is already planning or let's say process of planning. So we say, okay, uh, if we need to investigate something technically, we will do spike, typical XP approach. But then with spikes, 
<laughs> the issue is that uh, you might need to deliver whole solution. So then are you going to do 15 spikes? Then how fast are you going to do 15 spikes? Because you need to investigate which database are you going to use? You need to investigate um, which technology are you going to use? You need to understand business processes end to end, maybe outside of the scope of your team. So there are many things that you need to do. And then if you like structure this only around planning and grooming and say team is going to self-organize, you can end up having people who are, for example, like one engineer is, uh, uh, investigating one technology, second engineer is investigating second process. And then at the end, everybody knows a bit, but nobody knows the whole. So now my thinking about this is a bit different. And one of the things that people will ask you is to provide them date of when something is going to be done. Now, they do accept that unplanned things happen, but they want you then to, to early inform them. If you say, I'm not able to provide you date at all, then they will tell you, okay, can you give me the date when you are going to be able to provide me a date? And this is basically, I was asked that once in one of the conversations, it was, okay, you have technical complexity, can you give me date for date? And actually I was not able to provide that. And then it was, okay, we have a problem we need to solve because we don't have predictability at all. Now, practice that can help and that is actually enabling the team that to, to, to go through the whole process of delivery but having shared understanding of what you want to build, in my opinion, is not grooming meeting or spikes. It's something that I experienced and I liked a lot. It's called technical solution design. And this is basically the document where you outline everything that you want to do. You build it collaboratively, you build it iteratively, but at the end, you have one document that is laying out which architecture are you going to use? Uh, what are the risks? Uh, what are the security requirements? What are the compliance requirements? So many, many other things that are not just uh, obvious. And you know, if you just keep them in tickets of investigations, uh, knowledge will be scattered around. And then you define ownership. So ownership doesn't necessarily mean you have a person who is going to implement things, but ownership means that you have, let's say one or even better two engineers who are always involved in the topic. So, and that is leading you to, to the sense that, you know, <laughs> The team is not completely self-organizing because some things are pre-assigned or assigned during the time and then person stays with the topic while next topic is done for next free person. So things are somehow less in flux than you would expect from just saying team is self-organizing. The second meeting, and I already mentioned this, is retrospective. And, and I find it now, even though I like it, I find it highly questionable, again, in the way how it is usually described. You have like, one, one half hour time box every two weeks where people come together, then then write, they write on sticky notes or you have different ways to facilitate. Uh, conversation then team somehow uses dot voting to make decision. Now here are several challenges with this. First of all, you have problem with recency bias. So the most recent event is probably something that people will bring to the retrospective. And then the question is, okay, is this the most important thing to do? Probably not. Uh, sorry. Then a uh, second problem could be that, you know, if people use dot voting, that doesn't mean that they are voting for the best option. So um, a retrospective as a, uh, as a way of thinking that you need to adapt and you, you, you need to improve your process is definitely something that is highly valuable and something that is important. Uh, I see that messages on chat are popping up, but Tamara, you need to tell me if something is important. Oh, Otherwise, we can, I'll... We can, we, can, uh, we can talk about later. Okay, good. Uh, so instead of just doing a retrospective and saying, this is the room for the team, they get together and they do a retrospective, I would suggest something different. I would suggest what to track, what to look into, and then how are you going to do this? You have several ways. The first thing that I would absolutely advise is to have metrics. Um, there is quite good book called Accelerate, which is laying out four key metrics. I think out of them, three are the most important. First is like lead time. What is the average time that you deliver initiatives? Now, I know that there is a context and there is a complexity of all these things, but uh, having metrics can help you to have data-driven decisions later and data-driven discussions later. It's not just based on opinion or feelings. Uh, second important metric is failure rate. So, you know, like if you are trying to release, you fail, how often does this happen? Higher failure rate, 
usually indicates that you have something with the problem. And then time to recover. Usually in DevOps teams, this is one of the critical metrics. Like if you have an incident, how fast can you, can you roll back or do whatever is necessary that your system again is, is operating? Uh, the second thing is you need to assess progress against team goals. If team doesn't have goals, team should have goals. So uh, otherwise the question is, why do you have team? And usually goals of the, team is, uh, of the team are business goals. So you need to work closely with product and product managers to decide, okay, what should we achieve? Because then if you know what you want to achieve, then you can measure, are you achieving this? And of course, um, since you have people in the team, and this was especially interesting for me since... Uh, um, working in Berlin, you work from people who are literally from all over the world. I had call, a lot of colleagues from South America, from Eastern Europe, from Asia. So international team where everybody comes with their own set of beliefs or set of, own set of values. Um, something that I didn't do, but I found very interesting actually in Amazon is to define team tenants. And tenants are basically principles of, or beliefs that team holds true. Because then you can say, okay, are we behaving according to this belief? If we say, for example, we as a team are always on time for stand-up, then you can evaluate behavior and try to influence change of behavior in your team. If you don't have this, then yeah, everything is fine. But like whatever you agree and the question is, will you implement what you agreed? And the last point is to challenge beliefs. I had, for example, one direct who was... Uh, always telling, you know, like I never experienced uh, software where everything is covered with test. Maybe there are some companies that do this, uh, but I never experienced this. So, you know, he basically says that he doesn't believe in uh, possibility to have, I don't know, enough time, enough knowledge, whatever, whatever is there to write tests. And you can stuck with discussion around practices or you can go in discussion around his beliefs and try to challenge beliefs and try to change beliefs. When you are changing beliefs, then you will get actual change in the team and things will be done differently. So these are the practices. Now, how can you do them? For example, uh, some of them as engineering manager, you do in one-on-ones. Especially this is where you use a lot of feedback. Then, uh, for example, all operational things like how the services are doing, uh, how you operate them, do you have incidents, do you have post-mortems? how the costs are running if you have full DevOps model and you build it, you own it, uh, how, um, how are SLAs or SLOs for your services. This is all what you can move into operational review meeting. Moving things into operational review meeting leaves then the space in the team, especially the team that has maybe UX, product analyst and more other people to discuss on process things, uh, to discuss behavior, but not to go into discussion that is the most important for one person in one moment. So being able to adapt is important. Putting everything into one main thing, in my opinion, doesn't work and should be challenged and structured differently. And the last meeting that I see huge problem with, this is typical, is like review. Original idea, team ships something, there is a backlog, you have all necessary stakeholders in the meeting, product owner who can make decision, and then all of them are looking into backlog and making decision what is the highest priority. This cannot work for, from, because of multiple reasons. Uh, first one is, uh, again, uh, you can be, be highly influenced by recency bias. We released a feature and then we are liking it or not liking it and maybe making decision based on that. This is what we just do as a human beings. Second problem could be that, you know, like important stakeholders cannot join. And what then? If they were not in the meeting, we make decision and who cares? Third point is that some decisions are more strategic and you need input for more teams, from more teams. And not all of them can be always present. This is something that you can hardly, hardly get there. And then the question is, okay, what do you do in this meeting? You do the demo. Now, again, there are practices that can help not necessarily to do in one meeting. So, in order to make decisions and drive your product fo fo forward, you need to have right people at the right time working on the right scope. Now, what you can do is establish practice of doing weekly reporting that you send, for example, to all tactical st stakeholders, meaning product managers, engineers of other teams. This is where you just briefly send, okay, this is what we are working on. This is what we are planning. This is how we are progressing. And this is like just brief. Then you can have monthly review where you either invite, invite people, but I would suggest that you start writing and I will reflect later why writing is important. 
Um, in monthly review, you focus on, okay, what did I achieve from what I planned? Like, was, were there any bigger releases, bigger important things for the customers? And what do I plan going forward? Um, this usually is narrative for one team, but again, like you can also invite people. I would suggest some narrative so that people who are not in the meeting can read, provide you feedback, and then you make decisions to adapt. And the last point is that I experienced for the first time in Zalando, and I'm loving it. And it's also part of uh, Amazon and AWS culture, and it's called quarterly reviews. Quarterly reviews are usually uh, based on a review of business unit, not necessarily only one team. So quarterly review is usually written by people in the team. So for example, I was contributing to them, but also uh, product managers, um, heads of departments. Sometimes you get input from engineers as well. And then you create a document that reflects on KPIs and key business metrics. I don't know, how many orders did you have? How many of them in each country? What was the plan to sell in each country? Whatever is like, let's say this typical e-commerce metrics. Uh, and then you reflect on what you plan to do in next quarter or maybe even longer. And you reflect on how in terms of like, do you have all needed resources? You reflect on people, you reflect on operational excellence. And uh, quarterly reviews are usually done uh, by involving uh, senior stakeholders. Um, I was in meetings where Zalando CTO was there, then SVPs, VPs, and all of them would have questions that are close to their area of business or area of responsibility and ask you even questions, okay, you have very ambitious plan. Do you have enough people to achieve this? Or, you know, okay, you have hiring plan. Can you hire uh, fast enough? Or there are some other mechanisms that you use. But very, very... Uh, good practice. And this is something that I would suggest people to start doing um, even if they have smaller organizational units, because simply you, you take a break from what you did, you understand what happened and you try to make decisions. And this is basically this point of business agility and business adaptability that goes far beyond one team. Now, let's say that uh, we settled with, with delivery and we go to my favorite technical topic. And this is operational excellence. <laughs> Working for Zalando, uh, I got the opportunity to lead checkout team. And this is an um, amazing experience that I enjoyed every day, even though it was like very, very challenging. Um, and the part of um, the culture was that, you know, you build it, you own it. And teams were having pagers uh, and basically you would do on call duty. And as engineer manager, I really wanted to do this. I wanted to feel how services are running. And I was basically carrying pager or phone. And then you are uh, 24 hours available. If incident happens, you need to solve. And this is something that I would never recommend engineering manager again. And there is a very simple reason why. Because you lose a lot of energy, a lot of time, and you lose focus from actually doing the most important part of your work. So did I learn a ton of things? Yes, I did. Would I do it again from management perspective? No, I wouldn't. What is important from management perspective is to have some kind of operational review meeting. And when I think about operational review meeting for me, like when you are driving car and this car dashboard is very good metaphor. So uh, especially with modern cars, of course. So, you know, like you see how fast are you driving, you get immediate feedback. And for example, you see fuel consumption. And then you see if you are driving faster, you consume more fuel. Now, is that good or bad? This is something then you need to make judgment call. Maybe you need to arrive faster and then you accept that you're spending more. Or maybe you say, okay, I'm spending too much. I need to drive, I don't know, for 24 hours for 2000 kilometers and this is going to be a very expensive trip. Then you also see, okay, you know, there is a signal that, you know, car needs service. So you don't know exactly what is wrong with the car. And that's not your job, but you have clear signal that something is happening. So the purpose of operational review meeting is to get visibility of what is happening, to go through post-mortems and past incidents and understand what is the impact, did team do correction of errors, and if you own budget also to review costs. The most important thing I think for you, for you as somebody who is managing the team and delivery is to focus on uh, what's called health metrics. And they are basically answering to you, am I failing? They don't necessarily answer question, why are you failing? This is something where on-call engineer or engineer in the team will go deeper and understand that. And for that, you use diagnostics metrics, where you then say, okay, you know, 
uh, CPU utilization was high. J Java garbage collection doesn't work well, but these are all details on a high level. As a manager, you want to see, you know, for example, let's say again, like you have typical e-commerce website, customers are ordering, some orders fail because of valid reasons, some orders don't fail because of valid reasons. You want to spot these failures that are caused by bugs early enough. And this is the only thing that you want to know. You want to know it fast so that you can solve fast problems and you want to see trends over time. And um, if you are a manager, I would suggest that you look into dashboards that are giving you on very high level latencies. That means basically how responsive your system is. If you see, again, trend or issues, then this is something where you dive deep or you delegate someone to dive deep. You look into faults, you look into problems, and you look into the volume. Like, let, let me give you again an example. Let's say that you are having um, your e-com web shop in several countries, and then you say, okay, on a high level, we are selling 100 articles per hour, that's good. But then if you dive deep into volume, you can see that, okay, in one country, we are selling 50. In another country, we are selling 50. And in third country, we are selling zero. So something might be wrong there. And this is where you go and investigate deeper. But when you are also deciding on health metrics, you need to understand what you want to uh, track from business perspective, not necessarily from uh, technical perspective. And this is where um, your responsibility is to help the team and coach the team how to build dashboards where you understand without having being cluttered with diagnostics metrics. I saw many times dashboards where you see uh, for distributed databases, like how data is sharded uh, for Java, how much garbage collection that you had, CPU utilization. And this is all helpful when you are debugging the system, but not when you want to get understanding of what is happening there. Then um, after, after that, you get responsibility for, for maybe influencing more organization, because at the end, it's important to know also how you grow, how your people grow. And again, in Zalando, I was really, really lucky to be part of the group who was uh, working on uh, job guidelines for whole engineering job family. This is like for, uh, I think more than 1000 software engineers, where we said, okay, what is the responsibility of junior software engineer a software engineer, senior software engineer, principal engineer, and how does the career progression look like? And then um, um, I spoke with many friends about the, this later who are in, in different companies. And I think this is one of the most important things because again, um, an example from my, my experience, um, I was approached by direct and he told me, oh, but, but in my former company, I was senior software engineer. Okay, good. But how does that fit into your company? Now, if you don't have anything to show him, then you can, you can end up this, uh, having discussion. And then you have discussion with next direct. And then the question is, do you tell them the same story? And do you have the same criteria? Or you can create guidelines and explain to them how, how things work. And uh, how it looks like, like let's say in, in typical larger organization setup is that you have engineering manager that is responsible for one team some kind of senior engineering manager who is responsible for engineering in department and then director VP level, which then it depends, might be responsible for organizational unit engineering part or for whole, including product analytics and everything that goes there. So as engineering manager, you need also to know what you need to report and who is approaching you with what kind of questions. And as an individual contributor, usually when you are at software engineer level, uh, you work for one team and your scope of work is one team. And this is easy to understand. What is usually not easy to understand is that uh, your scope of work is mostly tactical. Probably somebody else defined business goals, somebody else defined scope, somebody else defined projects. And you need to help you know, with some kind of deeper dive understanding. And at the end, your role is to deliver software with highest possible quality. And this means that already practices that we sometimes con consider uh, very important or something that you need time actually are on that level. This is like domain-driven design, behavior-driven uh, design, uh, automated testing, continuous delivery, DevOps skills. This all comes already on that level. This is your technical expertise. And then sometimes people say, uh, you know, like I want to switch the team because in another team, I'm going to do Kotlin, not Java or Scala, not Python or whatever. 
And this is fine and companies should allow this, but person needs to be clear that learning more languages usually doesn't lead you to next step in career progression. Now, it might be, that depends. If you are a company that is selling trainings, then probably being able to deliver more trainings is one of the metrics. But let's say if you're building software product, this is a bit different. So what is expected from you as a senior software engineer is actually that you are significantly expanding scope of your work. You can take initiative that needs to be done across multiple teams, align them, organize meeting, uh, create transparency about what is happening. When something is not clear, you need to dive deep, help the teams to understand what is happening there. Have maybe a few more engineers working under your supervision, mentor people. So there is a lot of things when you are learning how to implement company on strategic level and you are dealing with higher levels of ambiguity. You cannot expect anymore as a senior software engineer that everything is defined for you. A lot of things will be unclear and you will need to go and understand them. And this is one of the biggest differences between senior software engineers and, and software engineers is ability to work with, with uh, complex things that are not clearly defined. And this is the skill like any other that you can learn. Why is that uh, important is because businesses are looking into, you know, like growing, introducing new things, getting new features where they don't for certainly know outcome. And then if they don't know outcome, it's hard to say how, how are they, how are you going to get clearly defined tasks and you just write code and everything is fine. But then usually senior software engineers ask, okay, but how do I grow my career? And then um, their uh, basically usually step is to some kind of principal software engineer. I intentionally didn't put software architect because um, what I noticed in most, again, product development companies is that they are getting away from, going away from uh, software architect role. And they say, you're a principal software engineer with, of course, your experience, your skills, and your knowledge. And based on that, you are uh, assigned to one unit. Now, your job family and description of your work doesn't go into level of details to say, you know, or oh, you are expert in distributed databases, or you are um, I don't know, expert in, in um, building ETL systems or whatever. This is something what is then basically tailored to the need of specific department. But then your scope of work is usually with director and VP level, and then you have discussions that are strategic. And I don't know, one simple example is, let's imagine that your company is just migrating to the cloud and they need to decide which cloud provider to choose. This is not anymore discussion about programming language. This is not even any more discussion of, can you do something uh, nice with service A or service B? But this goes into like, how do you set up networking? How do you set up, um, you know, for, for example, people who just have Windows working station, stations, how Active Directory works. So I'm now just giving you examples from, from some things that I do in, in AWS. But basically, when you are expanding scope of work, you are going significantly beyond what you got used to working and you need to provide answers in the same way how at the end c-level executives need to provide people who are say, shareholders or market answers about okay why would they buy shares why would they invest uh, simply the work is still technical but not anymore on that level that you are looking how to implement one feature and basically if you would define then job role, responsibilities, and guidelines, you are giving people opportunity to own their careers. Do they want to move laterally and say, okay, now I'm senior software engineer for search. Next time I'm going to be a senior software engineer for um, Android, and I want to switch technology completely fine. You're still staying senior software engineer. You are a highly valuable part of our company. But for principal software engineer, we need to expose you to tasks on that level. And then as a manager, you are helping the person to get visibility, to get feedback, to, to work on, on that level, but not uh, you, you, you are not telling him, do what you did and you are going to get promotion. You clearly guide him towards that. And now, um, basically, when you put all these things that I mentioned, the question is how do you create organization that can implement this in a way where Maybe you don't just tell the people how you do things and you, or you have informal meetings and then people agree and then you leave the meeting and say, this is what we agreed. And the thing that I, again, started experiencing in Zalando, 
but learned a lot since moving to AWS is this uh, narrative writing cu culture. What does it mean? Basically, uh, let's say that you are faced with a problem. And in, in Zalando, I experienced this. Like, for example, I wrote a paper where um, I wanted to create, let's say, transparency around technical challenges. And my boss approached me actually and asked me, okay, why do you write this document? And I, was, I, I answered to him, I want to create transparency. And he said, that's not enough. If you are presenting to senior stakeholders, you need to ask them what you want. And this made me think, and then I started actually thinking a lot, okay, what do I want with this? So when you write a narrative, first of all, you understand your thoughts and you understand what did you want to say. When you share narrative with others, for example, I could do presentation, PowerPoint presentation, but PowerPoint presentation is mostly sales tactic. Even though like this presentation is PowerPoint, but this is like a talk at one meetup. This is not... I'm not expecting you to make decision after my presentation. Uh, if you expect people to make decisions, then allow them to read and to consume information at their own pace. Maybe they want to read in the evening. Maybe they want to read in the morning. Why does that matter? You provided them relevant information. And if you are establishing business, I, I think the biggest advice that I have, always ask people to write. Could be software engineer asking for new programming language ask them to write reasons because it will also help him to think things through. You will get reasoning. Uh, you will get questions asked. You will get uh, uh, questions answered. And uh, at the end, people will be able to ask further questions and you will be able through several iterations to um, refine that narrative and make it better. Uh, when you are writing, and this was also a bit surprise for me, is like, okay, how do you write that people understand you better? And then I was always thinking, I'm not native English speaker. This could be quite a big challenge for me to write good narrative. But then suddenly I realized that, you know, people are actually expecting you to write simpler and to use simpler words because there are even researchers saying that even uh, doctorates that people wrote, and if they wrote them in a way that they use simple words, uh, they were much easier to understand for all audience. So the first tip is to simplify wording, make it shorter. Uh, make sentences that are uh, having less than 30 words uh, in it. Then replace adjectives with data. I think this is one of the most important things and things that I also needed to change because I was the ones that tending to say, okay, like, oh, this is like the worst system that I ever saw. But the worst system that I ever saw doesn't help anybody to make decision because, you know, what does it mean? What if somebody else saw a worse system that, than I saw? Does that then mean that my system is better and uh, what does it mean for business? So instead of that, try to be very clear what changed. And sometimes this could be challenging, especially with software systems. And um, to give you an example, you can have microservice and you can have microservice that is not performing well, but then you can say, okay, not performing well doesn't help. What helps? You can say this microservice is exposing five critical business functions, place order, um, store payment method, um, select delivery destination, whatever. And you say out of these uh, five, three of them are having failure rate of 20% um, under, under load of um, 200 orders per minute. And now instead of giving people your opinion that this is bad, you are asking them, is this bad? And then you can say, well, you know, like with this, we are earning enough money and there is actually more valuable initiative to do, or yes, this is now a problem we can quantify because this is 15 million euros in a month. Let's invest three engineers. We know their salary, we can make easily decision. And then suddenly from saying the service is bad, you have data-driven decision. So try to replace adjectives, even when you speak with people, not only when you are uh, designing systems. Then, um, Eliminate weasel words. This is another thing that was uh, very interesting for me and very interesting to get used to. Like saying ne nearly all customers doesn't tell you enough. On 500 customers and 5 million customers, nearly all, all means completely different thing. So again, try to use data, be precise. And uh, the thing that I like, and I like to use it in every conversation is with people now is does what you say or write pass a so what test? So what means what will happen afterwards? So if you say, 
oh, we have to use uh, Scala instead of Java. Then simple question uh, to your engineer could be, so what? What is going to be different? And then if he says, okay, I'm going to be happier, well, happiness is a relative thing. You can then try to explore in this direction, but everything that you do needs to pass so what test. If, if in case of writing, if it doesn't pass so what test, delete that paragraph or sentence. I tried to create one sample narrative just to show you how this thing look like. And um, I create imaginary situation like team is having problem with delivery of critical pro projects. Uh, nothing is going according to plan. They are sending a memo and at the end they say, we need to reschedule projects. <sighs> Communication that I saw so many times in my career. Now, um, what could be different with this if you look at things from different perspective and this is okay, I don't have information. What are those critical projects? What if I want to forward your memo to some other people? Then who is the team? Uh, what is huge impact? Who, who defined what is huge? What does it mean that we cannot de define, de deliver according to the plan? Uh, which incidents happen? Now, I try to improve this narrative and like to write it in a way how I would have write it now. The important thing that you know if you are adopting narrative writing culture is that even in Amazon, in AWS, people say narrative is something that people read and you rewrite a couple of times. That means that you know you are not creating perfect narrative from first try. And when I was writing this one, actually, I had several iterations on it to improve it, and I know that it still can be improved. But what is different? Well, first, like immediately, I'm being clear of call to action. So if somebody is reading my email, immediately knows what I'm asking him to do. Then. I'm giving a reason why I'm asking this. And then I'm giving context. Which team, uh, when did it happen? I'm giving more context about failed releases. I'm showing that I uh, know what were the problems. I'm also showing that the team is working on something else. And that's why I'm actually asking um, for, for postponing the deadline. I'm also showing that I was looking into the solution and that I can paint the picture of what is needed in order to actually deliver what we initially hoped. Then uh, I'm expecting if, so if let's say this was executive summary at the top, but then I'm going deeper and I'm saying, okay, what exactly happened? Here is the context. Here is the impact on customers. Here is the impact on sales. Here is when did it happen? Here is how long did it last? But I'm not saying this is the worst incident ever, or I'm not saying this was the biggest incident that I saw. I'm just trying to provide the data. And the last thing I'm also providing, how do I plan to fix it? Because if I'm asking you to postpone, I need to explain what am I going to do with this? Otherwise, yeah, just things pile up. Now, um, another practice that I really like that I experience is uh, trying to write FAQs in advance. Now, let's imagine that I wrote this narrative. I invited people to read it. And then they start asking me questions. Okay, but why cannot we just add more people? This is the question that you can actually foresee that somebody is going to ask. So why not trying in as a part of document to add FAQ session, a section and say, okay, these are commonly asked questions that we can think of, and these are the answers. What can happen there is, okay, you don't spend time on obvious answers or people say, okay, I saw what you're presenting here. How about this solution? Or um, can, can you provide me more data? Or can you make it more clear? And usually these are the questions, okay, critical thinking on what you wrote. What were the alternatives? Why this cannot happen? How can you ensure that this is actually going to happen when you do it? Things like that. Now you have fully formed document and I would advise everybody give it a try with whatever you are doing. It could be the smallest project in your company. It could be one person's career conversation, or it could be a business strategy that is a couple of, uh, of um, years long. What is Amazon practice in, in case of these longer uh, strategic outlooks is to have what they call six page narrative. And there is a limit on six pages. You can have appendix, but it's not expected people read appendix and it's expected to have FAQ as well. But you need to also to limit people because otherwise somebody can write you like 50 pages and then you cannot have meaningful discussion and not have enough time for everybody to read. So you also need to be mindful about how much you read. But um, the thing that I learned from my experience is that this comes with the practice as well. And now I'm coming to last slide. I will try to 
uh, be quick and finish as soon as possible. This was completely new for me when I joined AWS. I didn't hear, hear about mechanisms before, about all other things uh, I knew. And uh, when I went through internal training and then started thinking that way, then uh, it, it made actually sense and it made sense how, how things are organized. And there are a lot of connections with Lean and Agile, but what basically means to define mechanism is to define complete process when you want to do. Usually, what people do is to define tool, like one meeting, and then they, they don't set expectations. And that, that meeting after several times stops happening because people don't come. Now, Amazon approach is a bit different where we always start looking back from customer and then in this scenario, like from business challenge. And I will give you one example of a fully defined mechanism. It's similar for, for implementing agile software development. Why do you want to be agile and adaptive? Probably there is a business reason. You want to deliver projects from two years to three months. You want to deliver from 55 features to one feature and test quickly with customer. But there is always some business reason. Then you start by defining outputs. So you don't say, this is how I design the process or um, I design your application. I say what I want to get out of it. Then you de design a tool, but then you say, okay, how is this going to be adopted? Do people need to have training? Uh, do I need to print some material? Do I need to uh, ensure that I am present in that meeting and that I'm always present? But you need to think about adoption and you need to have inspection. And inspection is one of the most important things if you are going to be more senior leader. What does it mean? It means that as a more senior leader, you have even less understanding of details, but you need to be able to audit what is happening, not for sake of uh, micromanaging people on daily basis, but for sake of being able to coach them and help them to create a, at the end better mechanism for them to do their own work. Um, and this inspection part is really important. And again, you need to think it through. So it's not about establishing Scrum, but how do you know that Scrum your team is going to work? And then you have inputs and inputs are, uh, th this was also interesting for me to learn. Inputs are actually the, uh, the things that you as a lead are using to make desired outputs. Inputs could be people, could be, I don't know, licenses, could be additional resources in terms of, I don't know, new services, new applications, whatever you need in order to make it work. Why is that important? Well, let's say that you cannot deliver some initiative that you initially planned. I mean, you can say, okay, we add more people, but then adding more people could mean recruiting or could mean, you know, there are other parts of organization that could have engineers if this, what we are doing is big enough business challenge. So you are managing inputs. It's not necessarily one solution fits all. And at the end you have iteration. You, based on inspection, you assess and maybe you adjust the process. And basically with all this, you create process that is improving itself, but full process, not only, you don't only cherry pick the tool. You don't only cherry pick one thing. And I try to create one example mechanism and how would that look like? So if we start with business challenge, we say, okay, leaders don't know how systems are operating and they learn only from incidents. And, and this is challenge for the business because we have a lot of business issues. What you want to see as output is a cadence for monitoring operational excellence. I still didn't say, how are you going to do it? The tool could be weekly meeting where teams provide leaders with information about incidents, SLO breaches, correction of error reports. So they say, this is what happened. This is where it went wrong. This is what we are going to do on the long term to improve it. Now, uh, I made a mistake here and I apologize. Leaders attend uh, weekly operational me excellence meetings. This is um, basically the way to adopt the tool. So not only people are there, but leaders as well. And then leadership team discusses are those meetings sufficient for them? This is the way to inspect your tool and inspect whole mechanism to see, are you getting outputs that you initially thought? What is the inputs? Let's say in this operational review meeting, you have team leaders, they need to bring SLO data and metrics because without that, you have just conversation and they bring post-mortems. And then let's say that after adopting this mechanism and then like inspecting it and learning about it, you say, okay, I have first iteration where uh, 
leadership team says, okay, you know, this is going well, we understand better, but we want also to include on-call engineers because we want to get feedback from firsthand what is happening there. Uh, and for me personally, these three points, like defining outputs, insisting on adoption and managing inputs were key learnings. Of course, I understood how this process looked like and, and being interested in software development processes, not many things were new, but the fact that you can manage inputs and you should manage inputs in order to achieve outputs and do it in a structured way where you do several iterations to do this uh, was, was really nicely described and really fits my mental model and my thinking. Um, th there is quite a lot information online about how to build mechanism. And I would suggest that this is the, the, the better step to agility than establishing Scrum, Kanban, or any other process that is going, let's say, by the book, but saying, okay, we want short lead time. Short lead time is output. Then you define what is short. And then you work backwards through the whole process to define how you're going to do it. Now, what are my key learnings and key takeaways from all, all of this? I think um, you need to learn to lead self in order to earn the right to uh, lead others. And intentionally, I wrote uh, earning right to lead others because you can lead others by having title, but uh, usually you don't get respect. But if you, if you really show people that you know how to lead self, that you know how to ask questions, to show curiosity, to make decisions, to stand by decisions, to change decisions when you are wrong, then you are earning right to, to lead them. Uh, next thing is you should continuously inspect the work and provide timely feedback. So it's not just saying, okay, team is doing Scrum, so that's why they are going to do that, but try to search for outputs. And when you are looking for outputs, try to, try to provide feedback on this. This especially is important if you are a more senior position. A design organization to solve customer problems. This goes two way. Um, organizational design and like team design team should be structured in a way that they are solving customer problem. You don't split teams to back end and front end. You split teams around some business context, but also design organization in terms of whole organizational structure, career progression, because then you are in whole people development topic. You are uh, creating culture of looking into customers and looking into customer problems, not necessarily into uh, what is the next cool technical thing to do. Um, establish narrative writing culture. I cannot emphasize this enough. Uh, I got in love with this since I saw it first time and I'm working a lot on improving my skills there and I know that I can improve, but definitely the way to have unbiased, unbiased data-driven conversation to open debate to have the data, to have this scientific approach where if you need experiment, you run experiment based on data is something that I personally see as a good way to establish business results and get adaptability of the whole business, not necessarily only of the, of the team. Um, and the last point is managed by establishing mechanisms. So instead of focusing on processes and maybe well-known processes, try to think about what you want to achieve, define mechanism, write it down, and then iterate on this, inspect, adapt, and see how things work. And that would be all from me. Well done, Jörg. 56 minutes. Well done, <laughs> just on time. Uh, we have um, one question about the mechanisms. Is this an established method? Are there any resources on mechanism that you used? So uh, just type in, in Google search uh, Amazon mechanisms and uh, you are going to get some YouTube videos and some of them insights. Basically, the process that I shared is how establishing mechanisms look like. And uh, of course, we have internal documents and internal trainings on how to do this, but you have enough information. You also have some former Amazon people that wrote books about how Amazon works and you can learn a lot from there. So just Google for it. Thank you. Um, Azar shared something with us um, at the beginning of your presentation. Uh, he said there is also a problem of common, common belief that resources people have to be fully utilized. Unfortunately, this approach doesn't work uh, where uh, doesn't really work 
the cases you presented where the people are sick coming from vacation, etc. And he said, in my opinion, the best way is to underutilize people to have a room for a move. And he posted the link to a, a Slack blog, I think. No, it's a blog on uh, fs.blog. I will post the link to, to a chat. Uh, maybe I can just comment on this, especially because, uh, yeah, I know Azer very well and we had many conversations about this. Uh, but the thing where I changed my thinking there a bit is like, it's not necessarily the problem of how much you work you put to be done. The problem is if you don't have a mechanism to say, okay, this is too much, what we can deprioritize? Well, where do we escalate? So if, if everything is built that, you know, available people need and must deliver more than, than they can, then we have a problem. But if we say, okay, we are creating highly ambitious goal and we are aware that escalations would happen. Like, and, and this is the part again of AWS and Amazon culture that I personally love is like, escalation is something that you are encouraged to do and that you should do as early as possible. Now, again, if people are interested in that part, we can do actually a whole talk about Amazon innovation, culture, leadership principles. Leadership principles are used basically to drive this decision-making. But again, I would say create the process where people can escalate early and don't consider escalation as a something bad instead of under-promising for sake of uh, just being risk-aware. That would be now my opinion that changed a bit over the time. Okay, thank you. Um, we have one more question in a chat box. Uh, in your current position, do you manage people or just working with clients? Milan asked. Yeah, so uh, currently I don't directly um, manage people, uh, but the position and the role of senior solution architect is that you wear many uh, hats. So I'm working with AWS customers on, um, you know what we call customer obsession everything that is important from them so if i would see that you know they are adopting aws services and they are doing well but they need help with organizing structuring we help them there as well so sometimes we'll work with c-level executives sometimes we work with senior software engineers or software engineers like the role is is really spreading across many things and i'm using all my experience uh, when working with clients it's it's but no i'm not directly managing people okay thank you anna uh, anna pagan hi anna is um, she was our previous webinar speaker actually uh, she's asking how are company goals okrs distributed in the organization how do they fit in with the mechanisms and who is accountable for those goals okay so let me try to, to, to structure thoughts a bit about this. So I did experience companies implementing OKRs and working with them and then even having OKRs on a team level. And I experienced also something different where, again, there is this narrative writing culture where the goal is, let's say, part of the narrative. So you say, looking into business outcome that we want to achieve, let's, let's imagine that, let's take Amazon. Amazon is a web shop that uh, everybody knows, or at least... Many people know. And let's say that, you know, as, as Amazon, you want to increase number of third party sellers on your platform. Then you see, create business goal where you say, okay, currently we have 1 million, we want to have 1 million 500. So this is like 50% growth, let's say year over year or in three years. So that would be your narrative and that would be the goal that you want to achieve. Uh, usually how narratives are structured is that you write it as a, for a business unit and then you have a leader who is managing multiple business units. He takes all the narratives and write one narrative that goes after. Now, Amazon is, for example, known of being fairly flat organization, even though it's not completely flat. So you do have management levels. And at the end, you have goals that are sometimes business unit goals and you have goals that are uh, company goals or strategic goals. When it comes to company goals, this is like... Uh, SVP leadership of, of whole Amazon, who is discussing them and setting them on the long term. If it is lower goal, then it is VP of your area. Amazon has another practice that uh, I like, and it's, it's um, widely considered one of the reasons for success of Amazon. They call it single threaded owner. So at one point of time in business, you're stopping to be, let's say, director of engineering, director of product, director of analytics, and you are just becoming director of, let's say, 
or VP of Alexa, uh, VP of Prime Video, and you are responsible for business outcome of that area. So this is like, and this is how then also accountability look like, depending on which level you set the goal. So um, personally, I never saw OKRs fully working. I saw always many challenges with them. That's, that's just um, my impression. But with this narrative writing culture, I saw very, very interesting things in, in both of the companies that I mentioned. Of course, I cannot share you the details. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have a few more questions. Anna is asking also, how does role of engineering manager work with the product managers? Uh, this is um, a very interesting question. I saw some of my former colleagues from product management that, that uh, were at least uh, in, in the to-do list. I don't know did they join. Uh, well, um, you work very closely. This is the, the first thing. You, If you speak about one team level, you literally sit together and you have to. And the better collaboration you have, the better outcome you have. But because, for example, when, when again, I moved, I joined, I didn't know that much about business metrics, product metrics, but I was very, very curious about. So I was pulling product managers literally to teach me about this. You know, Why it is important to know how much we sell per country, per payment method or whatever whatever you do there so it was just literally my curiosity there but of course we also had conflicts and we had very difficult conversations and very difficult time where we even needed to escalate to let's say our boss or even upper in management chain in order to get feedback what to do so definitely very close collaboration i would say on daily basis because at the end everything is about product that you are trying to build Thank you. Uh, Azer is saying in SAP, there is a motto under promise, but over deliver. What would be the motto in Amazon in regards of promises delivery? So I cannot uh, quote exactly. I know that we have this and uh, I will paraphrase, but please like, this is my interpretation of it. Basically in Amazon, we do set ambitious goals highly ambitious, and then we work on them. And then we, as we learn, we are basically seeing how to, uh, um, how to adapt over the time. So Amazon goals are highly ambitious and we don't have this culture, let's say, say of under-promising. Now, uh, for example, if I speak for my role now working with the client, I'm trying to set realistic expectations because if I overpromise as a solution architect, then this could be a problem for my company, for client, for everyone. So this is where you try to answer the question that customer asks you. And then if you can give them uh, more than that, this is amazing and highly appreciated. But when, when you work with customers that have realistic problems, you don't try to tell them, okay, I'm going to solve every single problem that you have. Okay, thank you. Um, what you described, Ivana, uh, what you described is very agile Scrum. The whole mechanism is based on scientific approach. Isn't the core of Scrum the inspect, adapt, and incremental iterative? Writing sounds rather bureaucratic. Who are those documents intended to? Okay, so we have several questions here. Let me try go one by one. Uh, Yes, uh, what I described sounds essentially very agile at Scrum, especially if you take that three key pillars of, of Scrum are transparency, inspect, and adapt. So if you go a bit of step back and say, this is Scrum, then I fully agree. But then in Scrum, they also talk about self-organizing teams and specific meetings and whatnot. Even though they say it's a framework and you decide you want to implement this or not, but somehow at least, Again, like in 15 years, I saw so many implementations where somehow the implementation is what fails. And usually the implementation fails because this scientific approach is not implemented well. And yes, mechanism essentially is, is, is a scientific approach. I think usually people who did PhD are very familiar with this. It's not, and nobody's trying to say it's like um, uh, rocket science or something like this. Now, um, uh, sorry, I'm a bit distracted. Um, the next question is, uh, writing sounds rather bureaucratic. 
Uh, yes, many people think about writing that, and uh, I, I would not agree because, again, uh, if you cannot clearly write, the question is, can you clearly express yourself? If you even can, the question is, because communication is always bidirectional, so that person needs to understand you. And maybe you are not using the right words, or maybe you are not speaking to that person at the right, right point of time. Writing gives opportunity to everybody. You have people who are more introverted, people who are less introverted or more extroverted, depends. But you have different preferences. Then writing asks you to think hard. Now, if you think from this like typical Daniel Kahneman way, thinking fast and slow, people have tendency to think fast. And this, of course, happens in meetings, right? We are all there. You could be also influenced by things that happened in previous meetings. You can be distracted, whatnot. Writing asks you to focus and to provide clear reasoning behind decision, the decisions. It's, uh, it's simply the way to explain what you are doing. Now, um, writing one pager, I don't see what is bureaucratic about that. If you need decision and you need to involve more than one person in it, you anyway need to find a way to communicate. Uh, again, my advice is give it a try. By the way, there is an amazing book that I would again recommend to everybody. It's called The Pyramid Principle by Barbara Minto. And it lays out what was uh, the writing. He was the first woman employed in McKinsey. And basically he established this writing style in McKinsey. And this is somehow something that at least when we do Amazon writing trainings, uh, this book is considered to be one, one of references. It explains a lot more in details how to write narrative and what's the value of it. And again, if you just try to Google for pyramid principle, you will find a lot of examples and a lot of ways how this can help. Okay, thank you. Milena is asking, similar to Anna's question, how does an engineering manager work with agile coach or, or scrum master? Do you see, do you still see the need for those roles in organization like you described? Let me first tell you like what I see as a trend. So the trend is that uh, the, that role is going more towards consulting. So companies are, uh, product development companies are, are mostly removing the role. And when they need these like specific skills and deep mastery of these skills, then they ask for some consulting company to help. Now, um, in my team in Zalando, I had Zalando called this producer role. So I had a person who was, let's say, Agile Coach Scrum Master, but Zalando didn't use these terms. And of course, you know, knowing and understanding this, I utilized that person a lot and I enjoyed working with, with, with that person. Uh, so I did see a value. Uh, but then the question for, for the organization is, of course, you know, this is the employee with full-time salary. And then you are making also financial decision, meaning, okay, you need to pay this much per year. What can you get from consulting company per need basis? So I would say there is no black and white answer. The benefit is huge if the person mastered the topic. So if, for example, you have Agile and Scrum Coach or Scrum Master who deeply understands Lean, who deeply understands many of these things that I also mentioned here, and then can teach others or, you know, spend one month and help people to adapt. But as a full-time role, I see this uh, disappearing. Thank you, Jovan. Um, uh, David is asking, what kind of structure can be used to finalize with an individual development plans to help direct grow in their career? Uh, this is uh, one more thing that um, I learned in Amazon and I'm loving it. So in Amazon, basically the first thing that, that you get is uh, in, in AWS, but in Amazon is the same, uh, uh, that you own your own career. Now, the structure that you can use is first you have inputs, right? And input is what I, what I call job family guidelines. So you need to clearly describe what is expected from the person on their existing level. So meaning what I said, if you're a software engineer, from you, it is expected to deliver uh, features with high quality. You are not overachieving if you are doing this. You are just doing your job. If you want to become senior software engineer, go and take something difficult, something that is not clear, something that one area is struggling with for six months, for 12 months, show them how it's being done. And you also show that you are proactive. You also show ownership. You also show that 
you can continuously solve something. Uh, usually what I saw as the issue is that people want to have one project and then get promotion. That's not how things work. You need to repeatedly show that you can do things. Now, another thing, if we talk about development plan, is then you can look, okay, what am I doing now? What is expected on next level? And what are the things from that next level that I can do? And start creating track record of it. So for example, you are, uh, let's take my example in the land. I was engineering manager on one team and I was fairly ambitious to, to, to get promotion there. And then I participated in this job family definition for the whole company. I was part of the team that was there that had basically impact on more than 1000 engineers, was strategically important for the company, had exposure to VP level executives, all these things. So this was like one of the things that you do to show how big scope you, you can take. So, and the, the, the important thing is also that things are individual. Uh, one person will, for example, deliver five projects. Second person will maybe come up with a training and train uh, 200 engineers. So it's about scope, complexity, not necessarily about, you know, if you do these five te steps, like your colleague did, you're going to get promotion as well. These things don't work. You, every, every case is individual. And this is where you as, as a manager can help a lot. And, you know, uh, again, uh, interesting thing uh, when you join like these big tech organizations is that your manager and you as a manager don't need to have all answers. This was one of personal struggles that I had since I'm the person who got used to have all the answers or at least learn about them. You can just connect people and you can say, okay, you know, here is a senior principal engineer in, I don't know, cloud competence center that uh, was recently promoted, have a coffee with him, to let him tell, tell you your story, his story. And then you get several stories and you try to see, okay, are there any patterns in terms of how people act, how people speak, all these things. I hope that I managed to answer the question. Thank you. Um, Anna is asking how much should engineering manager have business acumen and understand the domain and customers they are serving versus the level of technical knowledge? You need to have both. Um, the, the only difference I think is that, of course, uh, uh, what makes you an engineering manager some skill of leading people, leading delivery, uh, having technical skills, and then you, know, you can join business domain that you don't have idea about. And this is where your ability to learn, ability to effectively communicate come in place, and you need, you need to get this business acumen. But um, I always find it painful to work when I don't understand business domain. Because um, again, sim simple thing, uh, going to engineering level, you are writing code to implement feature. If you don't understand business, you will start use vague language. You will put that vague language in the code. Your code will be read by someone two years ago and will have no idea what did you build. Compare this to understanding, you know, what does business do? And then, you know, putting it that. And let me try to give you one example, like typical thing that you have on, on e-commerce website is shopping cart. And if you call everything cart, then you lose specification. But if you say, you know, when I am shipping shopping cart, this cart also has predicted delivery date. And this is now shippable shopping cart. This is not anymore shopping cart. Maybe if you paid, then that becomes order. But understanding business language is one of the most critical thing I would say for every tech professional, including, you know, starting from junior software engineer, because otherwise you don't know what you're building. You're just writing code. Thank you, Jovan. Uh, Yelena shared something. I just wanted to say thank you. This was amazing. I'm in the process of obtaining more leadership oriented role and these actual account uh, actionable recommendations have opened up new areas in my mind. So thank you, Jovan. Uh, we have one more question. I'm interested to hear, what do you think? What is more important, win more customers and increase sales or work on tech debt in the system? Okay, for example, this is the typical question and I really like this question. This is the typical question where I would open conversation more because here we see uh, a lot of things that I would advise to do differently now. So what I would ask is, what does it mean more important? 
there should probably be something quantified from business perspective. Win more customers. Now, winning more customers can again mean different things. Are you just uh, uh, getting this upper part of the funnel when, where you are just getting users, but they never bought? Are you getting repeating customers? Are you getting customers that are going to buy five times this year? Who are these customers? So, and then the question is like, what does it mean increasing sales? Sometimes companies sell, uh, you know, even for a lower price in order to gain higher market share. So the goal is to actually increase market share, not necessarily to increase sales. Or working on technical depth, again, what is technical depth? What if you have one service that nobody's using? I had this in my team and it's, um, I think we just left it there. What, what, what can you do? Like, okay, you need it. Like sometimes you use it, but you know, compare this to the highly impacting feature. Like why, why do you want to fix tech technical depth? Like it's, it's not exhibition. You are not creating like, uh, uh, you know, a picture that, that you will post on the internet and earn money from this. You, you, you are solving real problems. So I would suggest to answer this question to, to, to the end, go and look for what Amazon calls working backwards process. I try to explain this with mechanisms. Start with the problem and start with the problem that you want to solve. And then you will get the answer to what is more important. But, sorry, I just need to make one more note. This is not excuse for making poor technical decisions. Uh, I noticed so many times that people who, for example, never experienced uh, uh, high coverage with automated tests were complaining about teams not having tests, but also not knowing how to get there. So that means that you as software engineer didn't do your home job, homework, and you need to do that first. So you need to learn how to, do, and this is why I'm emphasizing so much as a software engineer, you have responsibility to do your job in a high quality way. Okay, uh, two more questions. How do you find the balance in writing TSD that like every documentation gets out of date even before the implementation finishes versus delivering the actual code? Yeah, I know, I know uh, personally the, the person who asked this question. Uh, it's, it's a difficult one. And again, I, I, let me correlate with my experience since uh, um, I was the one actually uh, leading one technical solution design that was uh, my masterpiece. I would say something that I wanted to be very proud of and thinking through and whatnot. And it lasted for months. Honestly, I don't know, is it even finished? That, that would be really curious to know. Uh, and uh, the, the thing is now when I think about this, uh, it invested a lot of time without writing code. Now, what I wanted there is, is really to create solution that is going to be there for a couple of years, but because of that, I failed to see alternatives. This is why I was speaking so much about biases, your own beliefs and, and, and how you think about it. And this is where uh, things change for me, for example, this year, this year in Amazon. I would, I would now value more maybe bias for action and uh, go with, with less perfect solution or the solution that solves one problem that is identified, not all, but go faster with delivery. So at the moment I would prefer doing things and maybe even creating, uh, so be because what I'm referring to was the solution where I wanted to invent this business domain language, for example, which definitely not, not to invent, sorry, just to enforce usage of it. Uh, but maybe that was something that I would leave for later now. Not maybe for sure I would leave that for later now. Okay, uh, how to put get price on technical debt? Technical debt usually uh, is um, showing as some kind of problem because if it is not, then everything is fine. Technical debt usually influences your time to deliver or you have repeated failures to, to release, or you are investing significantly more resources into work. So for example, the most simple thing, you have manual QA. Every release requires one month or five manual QAs to do the job. You can put price on this. You don't have manual QA, you have like DevOps teams and you can say, okay, you know, our every release requires, I don't know, two hours of closely watching and it usually leads to one or two revenue impacting incidents with, 1 million euros per incident, 500,000 euros, 5 euros, doesn't matter. 
But basically, tech depth itself uh, is, is, is not the problem. The problem is usually what does it lead to? And it, at the end, it always leads to something that impacts customer. Another thing that you can do there is to introduce, I would advise SLOs. Some people say SLAs. Now SLAs for me has like this legal context in it. And then you come into tricky position. SLO says, okay, this is our objective. And you can say, okay, uh, you have like one business function, let's say uh, place order. Again, fairly simple one, my favorite. And you say, okay, you know, like place order has SLO of 99.99%. If we breach this, we stop the work and we, we do the job. And then you say, you put bucket in the team as well. You say, okay, one engineer is always dedicated to this. If you breach SLO. Now, of course, um, I try to implement this. It's, it's fairly difficult. You face many challenges. Like it's easy for me to say, like put SLOs and everything is fine. There is a process, but um, try with SLOs or try to see what I would advise even, even earlier impact on business. Because, you know, if in average with team of 10 people, you deliver two projects, if five of them are always deprioritized because you never have space. And if these uh, two projects that you release fail four times and cause two other teams to, to postpone their releases, you can clearly, and then this is where writing coming and this is where writing is important. Put all these things on the paper. You don't need to solve this because usually it's also, if it's that big, if it is impacting business, it's outside of your area of responsibility. You can influence and you say, I'm not creating judgment call. I'm not saying we are bad. I'm putting the data and asking for, from business leader of the area to tell me, is that business problem or not? Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Counting from five, four. <laughs> Thank you, Jovan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for being our guest today. And thank you for sharing your experience and many useful things. Uh, did you enjoy presenting as we, as we enjoyed listening to you? I did. It was, it was quite, quite uh, some time ago since I spoke last time. Uh, I wanted to say so many things. Uh, I hope that everybody got something out of it. They, they probably, they, they definitely did. Um, thank you all for joining us here and being here today. Um, I would like to invite you to follow us on LinkedIn and other social media platforms to be in loop with um, all the future events that we are preparing. Maybe Jovan will join us again in the future, who knows? Um, as I mentioned, uh, I will post a link to our career page. You might find something interesting for you. Uh, thank you everyone for your kind, uh, kind um, messages in a chat. Um, have a nice evening and weekend, and uh, we will see you next month. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.